Hello everyone, welcome to Reflections, the wisdom of Edgar Casey. We're coming to you this week courtesy of our broadcasting partner, moretalk.tv. This week on the show, we will be doing a presentation from the archives. And this presentation today is from Hugh Lynn Casey and Dr. Harmon Bro. And in this presentation, we'll enjoy together a discussion from a past ARE member Congress, circa the 1980s. Hugh Lynn Casey, for those who are unaware, was the eldest son of Edgar Casey. And he was a leading thinker, author, and spokesperson for psychological and paranormal subjects. Before his death, Hugh Lynn served his father's Association for Research and Enlightenment as chairman of the board, turning the ARE into an organization of international renown and developing widespread recognition and acceptance of subjects such as psychical research, dream analysis, meditation, and of course, spiritual development. <clears throat> For those who are unaware, Dr. Harmon Bro was a professor of philosophy and religion and a specialist in parapsychological aspects of religious life. He served as associate professor of religion and psychology at George Williams College in Chicago. And Dr. Harmon Bro's friendship with Edgar Casey led to his long relationship with the Association for Research and Enlightenment. Harmon actually did his doctoral thesis on Casey, titled The Charisma of the Seer, in which he examined the life and work of the man. Here is Hugh Lynn Casey and Dr. Harmon Bro. I hope everyone enjoys. It's a wild event tonight. Let me get this thing on. I'm trying to figure out how to draw out what's in Hugh Lynn Casey in just a couple of short sessions. A little bit like being asked by friends to be sure and draw a sketch of the Grand Canyon when you fly over it. <laughs> it's very deep, very wide, and very colorful. And I have a lovely and daunting challenge in trying to share with you some of the depth and wonder and greatness and excitement of this man who has influenced mine more than anybody else in this lifetime. I'm not going to look at the other lifetimes. I won't hold him responsible for anything but this one. Now, uh, there's a tradition for Congresses that's very old in the history of the work, and that is to have a work reading. While Edgar Casey was alive, this was part of the practice. There was a reading on a topic, a world affairs reading or an Atlantis reading or something on psychic phenomena. And then there was a work reading also on the nature and destiny and decisions of this organization. And what I propose to do is to try to punch you Lynn's buttons in such a way that we end up with what? We end up seeing not only him but ourselves. And this venture in which we're engaged, which is now growing so rapidly and challenging all of us with its potential and its scope and its dimensions. But let me start with this word treasure at the very top, Yulin. If I, I want to ask you what, do you, what do you see right off the bat as the real treasure you've been trying to share with people all these years and all these ways and all these places? Well, all of us, when we stare at you and wonder and listen or cheer... What is it that you've been trying to pull off and hand to us or pull out of us? Harmon, before I answer that question... It's going to go like this all evening. <laughs> there, are, there is a statement that should be made. There isn't anything that any person does without a great many people back up. There isn't a thing that I could have done as an individual without the backing, without the help of literally thousands of people like you. But there are one or two people that should be mentioned. <laughs> Just over your shoulder. Should be mentioned. I'm going to stick to the ones that are here now, oh. not the ones who have okay. departed, because it would get to be a long list. <laughs> but there's a lady uh, that I've been living with for a while <laughs> who is responsible for all of the stability, all of the balance, and perhaps more important for my gradual ability to understand and work with love with individuals. That lady is my wife, of course, who's here tonight. 
Sally Tegel Casey. Now, uh, there's another lady, of course, that has been a part of this work, and you meet her this week, you come to know her, and you do know her. The woman who I have known like a sister through the years, who was in our home from Dayton on, and who recorded the far the majority of the education readings. Now, without her, this work would certainly not have been what it is. That, of course, is Gladys Davis Turner. I could go down the list, and there are many, just many of them, and I can't, I won't even begin to mention the persons. Uh, the persons that I've wrestled with, sometimes the hardest, had the most difficulty with, have turned out to be uh, tremendously helpful for ARE such as this gentleman sitting over here. <laughs> I probably had as much trouble with him as anybody in ARE. <laughs> and I'm sure you can't see that now with his coat on and all <laughs> dressed up and everything. Well, it helps too, Hulin. Yeah. Well, you have what uh, our friend from Washington says is developed into the uh, uh, ARE gray here. That, uh, <laughs> Now, state that question over, and let me come back to it. Because without everybody, all of you, this, of course, wouldn't have been possible. Not a minute of it. I think, in a sense, you've already begun to answer my question, which is, what is the treasure you've wanted to share all this time? Most people would expect you to begin at once talking about the readings. No. And I felt, since I first met you by correspondence, that you knew about people... You knew about the depth and the mystery and the wonder of God that lives in us. And you were busy sharing that just as much as the readings. Is that true? Well, it's worse than that. <laughs> um, actually, and I almost hate to admit this, I have admitted it at times, but never in the presence of almost the full board of the trustees. <laughs> I don't work for ARE. I've never worked for ARE first. I work for a man. And it wasn't at Casey. This is some gentleman that I've come to know. He's alive. And I think he's closer, perhaps, to the earth than he's been in a long time. I'm speaking simply, of course, of Jesus. I have found in the ARE the finest vehicle for serving and for loving that I know about. And that's what he said do. And I think sooner or later, you'll all come to deal with this and face this, perhaps not in the terms of that name, which is one name of a long mystical experience of this expression of God in the earth, the Christ consciousness. But this is the name I use, and the name that perhaps the majority of you use. 
And the ARE has been a vehicle, has been a structure, has been a way to work with those principles. How can you love people? That's what he said do. How can you serve people? How can you go about to achieve and do this unless you begin to share the best that you know with each individual you meet without exception? Now, I found in the readings of Edu Casey and I found in the life of the man that I knew as Edu Casey a way to achieve and, and focus for thousands of people a very practical approach to this business of love and service. Hewlett, when, say something about this. When you look at ordinary jokers, which is all of us, and you're clear-eyed and you're deep, I've worked with you with some very troubled people. How do you keep telling yourself, this is God's creation. What do you say inside your head when you look into a scowling face or blank eyes? What do you keep saying to Hugh Lynn that keeps you believing in this soul, this Christ consciousness, and this beautiful destiny that I know you hang on to in people even when they're very difficult or very much at, at odds with themselves? What do you do that keeps us alive for you? I frequently answer a telephone, Carmen, as you know, and it's a person who is in trouble, uh, all kinds of trouble. As you say, they get into my office. I've got a secretary now that, that tries to keep a lot of them out, and there's wrestling goes on in the outer office. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good description. But uh, uh, through the 50 years, a great many have gotten in. Now, whether I'm on the phone or sitting talking, and all of you, so many of you, uh, I've done this with, not because you were in trouble necessarily, but because I wanted to, to, to connect. I start praying instantaneously for you. I begin to try to, to work with energy and light around you. Whatever you're talking about, whatever you're doing, whatever the voice is saying over the phone, while I listen, and this helps me focus, it helps me listen, and when I'm, I'm not on the defensive and I'm not scared uh, of what might happen to me, uh, it's easy to connect because I think in a way when you begin to to pray for and and deal with a, a spiritual energy in a person and that's what you look for you put around that stimulates prayer stimulates spiritual life in other people it, it is not just protective for you in any sense it's 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 a connection and it um, it's work for me. I've heard you say that in all our relating to one another we're either building or destroying. I'm certain of it, Harmon. Absolutely certain of it. I don't think there is any middle ground. I've used illustrations. You know them. They're simple. When you catch a hold of some people, you are certain that you have grabbed, if you shut your eyes, you would have a fish. A dead fish. <laughs> but there are others that you are not shocked, but you there is a real balance and energy. And it's it's a wonderful experience to to deal with with that communication that's going on there at a positive level. I think we do this as you know with the what we call the aura, the energy, uh, which is around us all the time. The, the body has a physical energy. 
but it also has emotional energy that it emits, and it has mental energy, and it has spiritual energy. And I think that slops over all the time. And uh, A.R.E. is encouraging the sloppiness by all this hugging that's going on. <laughs> this unselectivity, this taken us as we come, is in both the study groups and in that uh, rather marvelous adventure called Project X that I watched you do that spawned the camp and Atlantic University and a lot of tours, a lot of other nice things. Somewhere inside you seem to know early that people should be put together and held there until they dealt with each other. And it was an astonishing thing when you began to do it in the 50s. Uh, in this fashion, what was what, well, what you were you kill each from? other in the process, but it, it isn't always that bad. I don't mean that literally. Uh, it is rough. It is rough, and and many of you who are in study groups know that our uh, suggestion that you you just take whoever shows up uh, and and deal with it uh, is not always easy. Uh, people show up that you would not be caught anywhere else with, <laughs> but. I think all of you are going to have to come to the realization that as you begin to, to pray for people, as you begin to try to reach out and share what you have found to be good, more people are going to show up on your doorstep, more people are going to be in touch with you, and they're going to be in trouble. They have needs. And all of those needs you're not going to be prepared to handle. And you shouldn't try, in many instances, to handle them all, in any sense. But you should be prepared to, to know how to be discerning enough to recognize what you can work with, what a group can work with, and what should be sent to specialists that are past your, your point. Now, there are, you fail, and you get discouraged. I have failed many, many, many times. I fail more times on most of these procedures than there are people here. It's easy to fail when you're working like this. But uh, the successes are so rich and so wonderful. They're so worthwhile. And, and you begin to recognize that you can be used by God wherever you are whoever you are and that uh, the opportunities can be multiple many many faceted and many you do things far beyond your capacity because you're dealing not with your energy for none of us have any energy Energy is God's. We are the custodians of a little bit of it, temporarily. Uh, the physical, uh, the mental, even the spiritual in this sense. Custodians only. And we can channel it. We can, we can let it flow through us to other people. That's got to be our principle, Harmon. When you begin to, to push people around, when you begin to counsel people and, and become a, a guru for them, you, you, you really can get yourself maybe not in trouble in this life as fast as you can in other lives. And it can be long-range trouble. That's a special problem for us who draw hope and help from someone who seems to be giving information and counsel and guidance that we sometimes think, well, that's what I got to do, and dump things on each other, perhaps not even understanding that the readings were shaped carefully to each one to pull out what was there and not simply dump as well. And selected from an Olympium kind of view point. And that's their, of course, focus and their beauty uh, in, in this sense. But gradually, as you work to be able to as I, you've heard me say many times, the greatest psychic ability I know is to know when to keep your mouth shut. <laughs> because many of us don't. 
at the right time. And there's positive in every human being. Sometimes you have to look very hard to find it, <laughs> but most of us don't see very well. It's not that it's not there, we just can't see it. Let me pull you to some practical expressions of this. At the bottom of my page is something called mass culture. And I've often wanted to ask you in recent years, I haven't so much. When you dream about what we can build together, what kind of a world we can create, if this organization becomes a half million members and does half the work it can, what education and medicine and maybe family life and other things could be like when you dream in these terms, what do you see that might be different? How might classrooms be different? Mm -hmm. if reincarnation is real, ESP is real. And well, here again, I'd like to go back to the readings because the Board of Trustees has been hearing me for some time uh, on a theme that they sort of turned stony-eyed about, some of them more than others. Uh, I've been saying to them, that if we can just begin to encourage for the preparation of souls into the earth and there is a wealth of material on this in the education readings if we can just find and, and bring together people who will begin to set ideals and purposes and goals and bring make possible the channels become in a channel for children into this earth we can have among us in one two three four people more energy and more guidance and more help than we can imagine there are a lot of souls that are trying to get back here and they can't come back on certain levels they can't come back on certain vibrations and when it's just unthoughtless result of, of intercourse that is thoughtless when it's the result of, of, of just passion and, and no planning, no prayer, no meditation, no setting of ideals, no discussions that prepare the way and set the stage for what the soul can expect. If they have no prospect of guidance and training, we can continue to have chaos and we can go down. But it won't take but a few to heal this earth. It's never taken but a few. And I think there's a real challenge for us here in that material. And I know that we've got young people, and know we have, that are working and thinking and planning and concerned. And uh, this is important, not the mechanics. It, it, the mechanics are not enough. It's the ideals and the, and the purposes and goals. And we need to draw those young people. This is why the camp. The real reason. Back of all the fun and, and games and playing. This is why the encouragement for the children's activities all over the place. This is why. Because you begin to start early. And uh, begin to plan. And then when they begin to be channels for children. You can attract into this earth what it needs. That's what's going to heal us. That's what's going to save us. That's what's going to prepare the way for the coming of the Master. Not just us. That's our real contribution. And this runs all through these readings. You've read it, Harmon, you've talked about it, you've lectured about it, and others are beginning to do more and more of it. You all ought to look it up and, and get a hold of it. We're going to produce it, develop it, and, and test it, and work with it in this school. And then we're going to share it with the families. 
and with the counselors and the teachers. We don't have to hit but once for us to be very, very glad of the day we touched this information. Uh, Julian, can we, can ah. we work at this even in our study group settings? Is it fair and right not only to talk with one another, but take on each other's kids somewhat? Take them places, pray for them, back them, help them get <laughs> jobs, do some of that stuff? That's not common in our study group. Oh, I think we have to do this. I think we do, many of us do it all the time. I've been doing it for years. Yes, you I have. mean, this, this, this is not just... But there's such promise in so many young people. Such promise. And, and the promise, that's where the promise lies, really. You and I have worn out on this business. So. <laughs> that's true. We can build that kind of affection and ties with the children of our friends and our study group members and our ARE folks, can't we? That helps to make the channels of the future. Sure. Sure, and we should. Mm -hmm. We should encourage and, and encourage each other and people and, and make the material available. That's so important that we need to get this material out in the forms and in ways that will help people, young people, use it. And that's all of the, us who are older and past that point. Uh, we can help get it out. We can help make it possible for all these things to happen. Uh, that are happening and will happen in ARE uh, around the country. But it's part of your dream, isn't it, that there shall be the stimulus of uh, efforts, projects, programs, families, groups that uh, ARE provokes or calls into life so that others can keep trying to do it, both in ARE and around it. If I look at the clinic, I see a, an emblem of that kind of effort to get something going that can stimulate others now bearing fruit this has been part of what you've wanted to do all along, isn't it? To build these resource centers in some way that will foster more. Sure. And the, the uh, emphasis that's coming on the health facility that will be here, and there will be one here, a big one, um, should be, I think, the preventative. The whole business that will enable people to work now Perhaps this uh, comes out of my Chinese, uh, coming back. You know, Chinese doctors are paid to keep you well. You don't pay them. If you get sick, you quit paying. And uh, it's a much better approach uh, to the whole business. Uh, I think the preventative material in the education readings is so exciting in terms of the diet and the exercise and the massage and the sweats and the packs and the bad all the things that go into of course as someone said this uh, we're all sick to a degree but uh, I'm not looking at that I'm looking at the wellness and improving it and I think we'll be moving in this direction and I think it will make it possible for families and the groups to to share uh, uh, very definitely in a whole preventative uh, technique for example any of you and the uh, flock of you here, uh, who have tendencies toward arthritis. Uh, you, you have a terrific uh, opportunity to go upstairs and become familiar with whole patterns of diet that will stop you hurting now and keep you from hurting for a long time. And then if you slap a little peanut oil on you in the right places, uh, it'll keep you in greased and oiled so that you uh, wiggle right along in much better condition. <laughs> and it won't be so painful. Now, the preventative, I'm using that only as an illustration, for there are diet patterns in there for every tendency, and uh, we could probably find every tendency for suffering in this room. Well, we could find a lot of them. We could find one in every one of you, at least, but uh, probably a, a few extra in some of us. Many years ago now, it seems, oh, I don't know how many, five maybe, I had a heart attack, a very small heart attack. I had it right here in this room. It started here and continued over, fortunately, long enough for them to get it on electroencephalogram so they knew what it looked like. Very interesting looking. And um, 
It didn't turn out to be very serious, but it uh, put me in the hospital for a little while, and they're very careful and cautious about heart attacks. And uh, I stayed there for a while, got all involved in the hospital activities. After this, I came home. I, I realized that there were a lot of things in my life I needed to change. And one of them was my meditation and prayer time and my Bible reading and inspirational reading. And so I doubled it, what I'd been doing, and then I doubled that. And uh, as usual, and I think you'll find this to be true, when you push yourself in, in quietness and prayer... Uh, dreams become very interesting and change. And uh, I had a dream. Morton and Edwin Blumenthal were there. And uh, my father was there and my mother. A lot of people that had been with the early organization. And Morton was telling me, you Lynn, Everything's been straightened out over here. It's all right now. The ARE is going to have energy that it never had before. He said it's, and he used his simile, it's like money in the bank. And you can write a check on it for any amount. And Dad was there, and he said, yeah. He said, Hulin, it's, it's anything you can dream of can come about now. Now, if you knew those people, if you had known them, and some of you did, some of them, you'd know what I mean. Just the idea of that happening on that level. The possibility that this took place. Is a healing that can extend over to every one of our lives in a very rich and wonderful fashion. And should. I see you doing it in public and lectures. You, you remember to pick out things. You see someone's face in the audience. Nell is there, for example, or someone else. And you pick out and make a comment. You build right there a constructive team, a pool of energy, a pool of purposes. You focus on what people have brought to the campfire and the, the brand they put in the blaze. You keep trying to celebrate. And you do it more, I think, than any of us in, in, that I know in the, in the whole work. And I've seen you determined to do it, and I've heard you talk about it, making oh, yeah. up your mind to keep celebrating what each one has to give and to, to weave it into whatever you're doing. Yeah. You, you, you see, it's not always good to praise people to the person's face. It's so much better frequently to praise people to others, and it builds the thought forms for them and helps them. And, and quickens the whole pattern. And where you are closely interrelated, as we are here, um, I think that most of you realize this, and no harm in sense is this. When, when I am talking publicly, uh, I do talk to individuals in, in the audience. Last night I said so. <laughs> uh, just so two or three or four of you would get it. But... Uh, <laughs> One or two of them were kind of asleep, and I didn't want to wake them up. But seriously, uh, you do talk to people, and you learn. You, you have to do this, because I don't have opportunities to see you. I can't sit down with all of you anymore. I, I used to spend a half hour, an hour, with, with lots of you when I, when I saw you, or did across the country. And it's impossible now. The two dead blasted many of you. And they... They are new people, so many new ones coming that I need to, to communicate with and touch. Part of the process then of working with our karma in ourselves and one another's, as you've said so often, and Charles Thomas says it beautifully too, is selecting which karma we're going to pull on. 
And I, I, I could welcome some comments from you about the, the ways in which we can work with one another to pull forth the better patterns. For me, karma is simply memory. Nothing else. You and I have no karma with each other. There's nothing between people. There's only memory in relationship to each other, which is quite different because it's buried in me if I have memory, or it's buried in them. So what you remember is what you have to deal with in terms of karma. This is what Jesus was talking about when he talked about thought patterns and thoughts. He didn't call it patterns, but he said, you know, you don't have to commit something for it to affect you. All you have to do is think of it. And he was very specific. He was talking to some men, so he was naturally talking about women. And he said, if you just lust after a woman, you've already committed the act. And you pay for that. Don't kid yourself. You don't have to do it. You don't have to fulfill it at a body level. All you have to do is think about it. So the beginning here is in the mind. And the patterns are built there. And we store them. You've got a beautiful setup in the readings for this. Uh, look around you. If you want to begin to deal with your karma as memory, look around you. Pick out the best relationships of your life and deepen them, enrich them. But also, pick out the worst ones, the difficult ones, and deal with those. Don't leave them hanging. Don't let them go. Don't pass them by because they grow. Things repeat themselves with karmic memories. And they have strong, deep, emotional. Ed Casey talked about that the lives in the earth brought the tremendous emotional urges that we, we have. This is why one of the reasons I think they come through the endocrines, because of the strong emotional relationship. These, uh, but the repetition and the strong emotions, but then deal with the the worst and the best and deepen and work with and face up to and, and begin to, to try to handle these. Now, sometimes you can't avoid that. Uh, I couldn't. I, uh, you make a choice and you run right front into it. Uh, I arrived in the earth and by golly, here were a couple of my memories holding me my papa and my mama and uh, I had a better time I had a rough time uh, with education for me he was he was far more than just a father a very good one far more than just a good Sunday school teacher far more than the greatest psychic I've ever seen come down the tracks and I've looked at a lot of them he was many other things too that I had to face and had to deal with and yet fortunately he was also the most loving person I've ever known and it was beautiful to deal with my jealousy and my hate for it was that at times in the light of his love that he was able to transmit and work with. It was a beautiful experience, and it worked out. I'm, I'm, I've cleaned up a lot of stuff, both of our memories. On well, this. One of the things that you brought yeah. to him that uh, you talked with me about... Many opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> Something in your nature that I think is very, very special and that I've, I've experienced too. When there's a tangle, when there's a hurt, when there's a problem, when there's a wound, you confront it. Oh, yeah. yeah. You don't sit yeah. around on it and mm -hmm. let it fester. You go after it. Get on the phone, write a letter, go see somebody. Mm -hmm. And this is 
something that uh, that you brought even to him, as I remember, oh, because yeah, it wasn't yeah. always that easy for him, or it wasn't always his style, perhaps, <laughs> to, to jump in that direct, blunt way. Well, he never, he didn't hold on to things like I did. I've been holding on to things for 10,000 years. He'd be turned them loose. That's true. Turned them loose. That's and he, he could blow up and blast me right out of the room easily. As you well know, he was capable of doing. He could get mad at me quicker than he could at anybody else, even you. He, right. he even admitted that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and... and uh, but he'd get over it. It it had it had passed. He didn't hold these things in the thought patterns. And you and I have a tendency to hold on to them and keep reactivating them. I've used that, that crazy illustration I watched with a man in New York once. I was with him in a taxi cab and had this violent argument with the taxi cab driver. Oh, he, he was overpaying the thing and he was blasting the man. They had a big almost a fight. And we came on in, went upstairs, and we were a whole lot of people there, and it was a nice meeting, and, and everything was going fine. And all of a sudden, I heard all this, there was a big group standing around, and this man was reliving and saying what he had said to the taxi cab driver all over again. And he was red in the face, and he was saying a lot of things he hadn't said that he wished he had said. <laughs> <laughs> The craziest thing, we catch ourselves if we watch ourselves going and reactivating. And Dad didn't do this. He, he never, never held. He turned loose. He would blow up, but, but turn loose of it very quickly. Did that with the hospital? Oh, you, anything. Anything he could walk out of something. Turn, I've been trying to do that for years. <laughs> you, you, you do it by quitting thinking about it. You take your mind off of it. That's a little different from repressing, isn't oh, it? Oh, yeah, quite different. You, you just don't think about it. You don't deal with it. You don't... Don't feed it, huh? Feed it at all. You cannot feed these things, this, these negative karmic patterns, or they grow. And they get so big, they really swamp you. The stuff that spills out of the unconscious, you can't handle. It, it blasts you, and, and you, you slip. The body, what breaks, of course, is the body, the flesh. And you begin to suffer. And then you wonder, what in the world is wrong with me? And you, you have, have set the pattern for this. You've torn yourself apart. You've made yourself sick. Emotionally, mentally. And then it reproduces itself in the flesh. Later, it comes more slowly. In All of psychosomatic medicine, of course, is telling us this. In addition to this release business, there are other disciplines that I've seen you use that uh, many of us have and, and cherish them. One of them, a tiny little one, but that many have picked up is those crazy little circles with a smile in it in your letters, that where you're uh, grinning at yourself and at the world and at karma and at, at us and at the whole scheme as you go along. Mm -hmm. And that's been a choice for you, hasn't it? Oh, yeah. You know, spirit. I think, too, that we should mention at this point, I'm a great believer in confessional prayer. Now, I don't mean in... in there are some things you can go out and talk to your best friend about. There's some things you can sit down and share with your wife or your husband or a, a son or a daughter or some mother or father or somebody related. But there are other things that you need to work with that you just deal with in your mind with God. And uh, this confessional prayer, that, that business of forgiving yourself and then asking God's forgiveness. Now, this is while you're looking at a face of the person that you're having the difficulty with. Yes. And, and you hold this. You can do this every day until it goes away. It won't take you but about a week to get rid of something you've been carrying around this life. And 14 days will clean up several thousand years um, you forgive you forgive yourself of what you've done and said to this face that you're looking at and then you you ask God's forgiveness and then you forgive the face the person that it stands for that's just a symbol and then 
you bless and you put light around and you love that faith. You do this regularly for a while and relationships will clear, clean up. And you know what happens? It's wonderful. The other person seems to get a lot better. (laughs) Actually, of course, we begin to change too within ourselves. That loving can also be chosen, can't it? One of the things that I mentioned to you the other day that a happy memory I have is a letter you wrote me many, many years ago in which you said, never write me without putting love at the end somewhere. Well, Herman, I needed that from you. (laughs) I needed it. You're very, very (laughs) capable, and and, uh, I knew you were capable, but uh, I hadn't been getting uh, (laughs) I've tried since That's then, true. but we can make those choices, can oh, we? Oh, sure we do. Very and, concrete and they are, ways. They are uh, uh, daily choices. Yes. This is the important thing. We, we do not do things quickly. Don't think that you can just clean, wipe, push something away quickly. It, 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 it didn't build itself quickly if it relates to karmic patterns, to karmic memory. And it may have taken you a long time. As I've often said, it the mess we're in we can't possibly have created in one life it, and we've got to blame it on other people if, if, you know why are we here if they created it you see I mean it doesn't make sense and so it, we need to work diligently persistently that's the phrase for it isn't it it's line upon line here a little there a little the precept upon the tree, step by step but, but continuous working at it will gradually get rid of it. One way in which I've seen you do that, and your father and mother did it too, was in, uh, is in uh, persisting with people you take on. Oh, yeah. you, you make a promise to your Lord, I suppose, uh, mm-hmm. to them and to yourself, and then you hang on, my goodness how you hang on, years after years <laughs> after years. Even when things go bad and problems arise, you hang on, pray for them, talk to them, and won't let go. We can choose to do this, can't we? Those that are that we take into the bundle of our days, we can hang on to. Them. We have to. We have to. Uh, you know, we got a wonderful example. God's been hanging on to us for a long time, <laughs> and if we don't act like like I can, why well, we got to be persistent. We've got to stay in there and keep working at it. Uh, this this whole business gets to be uh, so exciting. Part it's of the so uh, discipline that enables us to do this with our peers and our spouses and all the rest, too, that I've seen you work at, and many of us have picked it up from the readings, is taking on somebody less fortunate, somebody in trouble. You know, Dad weak. has a beautiful phrase about that. He says... Go out and get yourself somebody that's younger than you are and spend energy and time. Not somebody you're responsible for. Not somebody you got to do it for. Not somebody you, you already are doing things for. But somebody that's, that's outside of your little world and help them. Make their life richer. Make their life fuller. Give them assistance. It may be just encouragement. It may be just uh, money. It may be whatever you've got. Talent, suggestions, uh, prayer. Uh, there's thousands of things you can do with, with people, young people. Or, he says, if you don't want to work with a young person, maybe you've got a problem, uh, then go get an old person who's really uh, beyond your can. Uh, and and make their life richer. Now, many people do this. They do it in hospitals. They do it in in uh, rest homes. They do it in all kinds of places. And this is wonderful, but particular, not not a general thing that people see, but these private things that you work at with individuals. And if you don't know any old people, you know that a past uh, that people call old. Uh, I will be glad to volunteer. (laughs) Many of us have heard you speak about this, and we've read it in the readings. 
it occurs to me to do something in just gently that I hadn't planned to and to say that I watched you Lynn do this next time somebody says pick on somebody who needs you remember this guy is not just preaching he does it as many of us really want to do but we can take the time and the effort to do it you also found not only in the readings but in the fact of the gift that your father had something very special to share didn't you that was more than just a wonder a phenomenon even your first statement says that and even more than a very good psychic but something was being transacted in the quiet of those readings that held promise for a lot of us for all of us that was um, I've felt uh, part of the glory part of the hope part of the promise that you kept trying to tell us tell many people about not just he did this and he did that but God has business to do with us in some ways yeah and as I saw it Andrew Casey it's working Andrew Casey was the who had had really come I think to help uh, prepare a way uh, for this consciousness to develop in the earth and I wanted to help of course but the thing that strikes you almost immediately and I even mentioned it in 50 years ago is that Edgar Casey was saying and challenging from the very beginning of the first readings that this was not unique was not a phenomenon was not different it was simply possible for us all we all had this quality and it's uh, the quality of a, of a spiritual nature. It's the soul. And it's uh, within us all. I went through college and went around with him once, talking to, to people. We, we knocked on doors of seminary students at the University of Chicago. And, and tried to find somebody that was praying, that, that was interested in a course in prayer. That it were, These were people who were preparing to be ministers. There wasn't the, the uh, uh, you know, we were moving away, as you remember very well, Harmon, from, and here with the, the education material was this uh, focus and emphasis on the spiritual nature of every man and the tremendous capacity uh, that we all have to reach far beyond ourselves in this uh, wherever we are whatever we're doing and to serve in ways we, we simply do not understand that's a big order for us all I think we're getting probably to the point where we're coming to a close tonight as well uh, and beginning to pull some of our reflections together. Let me draw you out just a little bit more on some of the things you dream for tomorrow's tomorrow in education and medicine. You've spoken about childbearing and rearing in our families. What about some of these institutions? Can you see osteopathy really different in a thinkable future in our country? Can we do something about that? Well, the, the whole business of manipulative therapy is, is, is an area you, you remember of course that dad lived and gave readings in a time when osteopathy was, was coming it is growing and developing and was still being beat upon at that time by the medical profession as the chiropractors are being beaten upon now by the medical profession and then uh, the chiropractic started and it was a different kind of manipulative therapy and so forth but uh, all types of manipulative therapy become important and valuable uh, as I see it today and I think in this whole manipulative therapy field and massage field you're running into the opportunities for the flow of energies from one person to another we all can heal if, if we want to heal, if that's our purpose, if that's our goal, if we become channels for it. And so it, it's important that these, the principles back up 
all of the principles back of. It's not just a manipulation of a place in your spine. It's not just a rubbing and making you feel good. Uh, it's the whole business of, of the healing that is possible, the stimulation of the circulation and all of the business that is not just the physical but the emotional and the, the, the whole pattern uh, that becomes involved in any type of manipulative therapy. Now, you all ought to be massaging each other. It, it's, a, it's a very important kind of thing recommended again and again in the re not just because of the massage, but because of the opportunity to touch in a healing and at the same time in a prayerful way. It can be very, very helpful. Berlin, when you speak about our being custodians of the love and grace and helpfulness of God in our relationships with those to whom we bind ourselves, I wonder if you're not talking about something as potent, ultimately, as any kind of reading. Many people who are critics of ARE say, well, they just keep going round and round those readings, they're studying the works of someone who's dead, and not looking and listening perhaps to the kind of thing you've just said that every time we love and pray and reach and are reached we enter into a transaction potentially as deep as those readings is that true in in its essence that I think of course we we're using uh, g taking God at at his at the face value that he can work and does work through us and that he challenges every one of us and I think he's constantly reaching for man constantly in touch and we don't know it we've slowed down so that we really don't recognize the connection we've lost it we've lost touch and um, I think as we begin to be more sensitive, it begins to flow and we begin to understand that he is using us in a very direct way. I'm glad this is being recorded because those last few sentences are as near to the core of you as anything I know. That you're always saying, showing, try yelling, <laughs> pushing, hoping that we'll catch on to this, that he's reaching for us and through us all the time. You really, you really mean this, don't you? Yes. We have a treasure handed to us, given to us, that we can work with. Part of your job was to get out there and yell a bit ahead of us. And I hear you saying that we've got to grab it and run with it with all the energy we've got to see where we can go. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Well, never better. Never better. Thank you, Hope everyone enjoyed our presentation from the archives today with Hugh Lynn Casey and Dr. Harmon Bro. Don't forget the ARE is celebrating our 85th anniversary at Members Congress. In 1931, Edgar Casey gave his first reading on the ARE's Member Congress, stating that we should gather together each year to renew our purpose. So join us this year on June 19th through the 24th to help us celebrate. You can visit edgarcasey.org slash membership to become a member or register at edgarcasey.org slash conferences. On behalf of the ARE and moretalk.tv, thank you so much for tuning in to Reflections, the wisdom of Edgar Casey. Hope everyone has a wonderful week. Much love. Now it is time for the thought for the day here on Reflections, and joining me as always for the thought for the day is Dr. Bill Austin. Bill, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Brent. I hope that you are as well. I am excellent. Thank you so much. Great. And Great. if you can go ahead and read the thought for the day today for our listeners. I'd be, I'd be happy to. This thought comes from reading 5098-1. Remember. The soft word turns away wrath and it brings joy. The kind word, as you have found in your own experience, oft has made the day much brighter for you. Make many days brighter for others, and in making them more and more in attune with love, patience, long-suffering, gentleness, and kindness, you will make for yourself a surety in those things 
that take hold on peace, harmony, and joy. These should be a part of your experience ever. Boy, talk about a power-packed reading. You know, it starts out, you know, very nicely. You know, be, be kind. You know, uh, say a kind word. It's helped you in the past, you know, it, and you can help others by saying something uh, kind and gentle. You know, you're, you're really helping them, as he says, attune to love, patience, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, all the attributes, I think, of the divine. And it's also saying you're going to get what you give. If you give this out, then you'll experience peace, harmony, and joy within yourself. And who wouldn't want that? You know, so when he says, make this part of your experience ever. You know, what, a, what a wonderful promise that is. You know, and it goes right along with Jesus adding to that first amendment, you know, of take care of your neighbor. Love thy neighbor as thyself. You know, and uh, we so often see in the Casey readings, I am my brother's keeper. And what could be nicer than to say a kind word in a gentle manner to someone? It can really soothe their soul. Absolutely. Yeah, I like this one. In a, in a nutshell, this reminds me of how so many times when we're looking for kind of the answers to our solution or where to, where's the next stepping stone on, on our path and where, where should we head? Um, there's, as, as I've said before, there's a lot of fear surrounding that. And a lot of people, when they, when they take that long, hard look at themselves and say, okay, it is time to, you know, start adjusting things, start making some changes in my life. Um, you know, try to better myself and better all those around me. Um, when they look at themselves, it can be very difficult to say, where do I start? You know, so many people have kind of just, uh, a lot of times we let things go for so long that it can be tough to say, you know, well, where do I start? Where do I start when it comes to, to finding peace, finding happiness inside myself and, you know, bettering everything around me? And I think the most important thing that Casey brings out in his readings is being of service is should always be your essential focus is that if you look at yourself and you're overwhelmed, you don't know where to start. Don't start with yourself. Start helping others. Start being of service of others that's a good place to start because what Casey says is there's this feedback loop that if you put yourself out there to help others, even, you know, as something as small as just speaking soft, gentle words to people, you know, interjecting little things here and there for others, um, what happens is this feedback loop will help you to find that internal peace, that internal happiness that you're looking for because that, that feedback, that karmic feedback is inevitable. It's, it's, it's constantly going on. So if you're putting yourself out there to, to be kind to other people and, uh, you know, lift up other people's lives with love and patience, long suffering, gentleness and kindness, as Casey says, um, you will absolutely 100% receive the benefits of that. And it'll, it'll come in the form of, you know, health and peace, tranquility, um, all of these kind of fruits of the spirit that Casey talks about and you receive the benefits of that. So if you don't know where to start, start by helping others, I think would be the thing that Casey would, would say. You know, I think you've really hit the uh, the nail on the head. That is the way to uh, to start. You know, it's it's sometimes easy to do when you're feeling good, but when yeah. you're not feeling good, it's a wonderful tool to use so that you will feel good. Yeah. Because if you if you give peace, you'll receive peace. If you give kindness, you'll receive kindness. Yeah, I like absolutely <laughs> wonderful, Bill. Well, thank you, as always, for joining me today on Reflections. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show and hear your thoughts. Oh, it's great to be here. Have a wonderful day today, Brent. Thanks, Bill. You too. I'll see you next week. I look forward to it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.